What's going on, family? I'm Scrapbook Boxing Museum of the Forgotten Fisticuff Series. I want to talk to you today about the ring ranking systems, 1941 to 1945. And what we're doing is basically completing the conversation of the last three prior videos. Those videos, as a reminder, we're concerning the Black Murders Row and their schedule. And we want to make sure that we're clear as to why those men didn't get a fair shake and didn't get a fair title shot opportunity. And so we'll take a look at the ring ranking system. And we'll probably look at a few records just to make sure we're clear as to why these men didn't get a title shot. If they were worthy of one. So let's take a look. So we're looking at the 1941 ring rankings. And I want to stick specifically with the middleweight and welterweight divisions. So as we look here in the middleweight division, Tony Zale is the champion. I stabilized this camera because I wanted to make sure I'm not shaking as I'm holding this. All right, so the middleweight division is Tony Zale. Ranked number one is Georgie Abrams. I don't know if you can see this clearly. Let's see if I can open this up a little bit. I'm not sure, it's a little blurry to me. Hold on one second here. All right, so we're going to look at Tony Zale. He's the champion. Georgie Abrams is ranked number one. Ezra Charles is ranked number two. I'm going to stay right there for one moment. Ezra Charles. He never faced Georgie Abrams in 19... But he won. Georgie Abrams was planning to face Tony Zale. Georgie Abrams would have one portion of the title... And Tony Zale would have the other portion. They would fight one another, unify, and Tony Zale would come out victorious. And once Tony Zale became the middleweight champion of the world, that's when Black Murders Row began to have their problems. We're going to follow this trend. Now, Ezra Charles was ranked number two. Let's take a look at Ezra Charles' record leading up to that point. All right, so Ezra Charles, this is Ezra Charles' record. Began 1939 in the amateurs. I'm sorry, 1937 in the amateurs. And he would turn professional in 1940. You can see his amateur record. He was in every conceivable amateur tournament that was offered to him. He was 42 and 0 as an amateur. Now, as you see here, 1940. No losses, all but three knockouts. 1941, the only loss was to Ken Overland. I want you to pay attention to Ken Overland. One moment. 1942. January 12th of 1942. Being in a ring with Anton Christopherides. Now, I want to stabilize this camera one moment. All right, so now, as a Charles turned professional in 1940, as you can see... He has all but three knockouts. All right, he knocked out all his opponents besides Marty Simmons, Charlie Banks, and John Reeves. Now, as we go down to 1941, 
He has one loss, his first loss, to Ken Overland. Ken Overland would defeat Seferino Garcia, and he would become the middleweight champion of the world. Now, I want you to pay attention to Ken Overland for one moment as we go through the record of Ezra Charles. 1942 was a very good year for Ezra Charles. January 12th of that year, he would take on Anton Christopherides in Cincinnati, Ohio. He would knock him out in three rounds. Anton Christopherides would wind up becoming a light heavyweight champion of the world. March 2nd, 1942, Ken Overland, Cincinnati, Ohio. I asked you to pay close attention to Ken Overland. Why? Because now it's a draw in 10 rounds. They're not going to give the verdict as it Charles over Ken Overland. As you scroll down, May 13th, he takes on Kid Tenaro, Cincinnati, Ohio. Kid Tenaro was a decent fighter. Ezra Charles was pretty much starting out in his career. He lost 10 rounds to Kid Tenaro. But May 25th, he would take on Charlie Burley in Pittsburgh, defeat him in 10 rounds. And then June 29th, he would take on Charlie Burley again in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He would defeat him again in 10 rounds. July 14th, he would take on Steve Mamanox. Cincinnati, Ohio, knock him out one round. August 17th, no, I'm sorry, July 27th, he would take on Booker Beckworth in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He would stop him in nine rounds. August 17th, Jose Basora, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He would stop him in five rounds. September 15th, Moses Brown, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He would stop him in six rounds. October 27th, Joey Maxim, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He would defeat him in 10 rounds. And then he would repeat it. December 1st, 1942. Joey Maxim, Cleveland, Ohio. He would defeat him in 10 rounds. Why is that impressive? Because Joey Maxim, who he defeated twice back to back, would wind up becoming a world light heavyweight champion. And he would defeat Freddie Mills. Ezra Charles would never receive a title shot, although he defeated two men who would become the World Light Heavyweight Champion. Okay, so we're back at 1941. This time we're looking at the welterweight division. The world champion is Freddie Red Cochrane. Freddie Red Cochrane had defeated Fizzy Zivic for that title. Ranked number one is Ray Robinson. Ray Robinson never received a title shot in fact, he never faced Freddie Red Cochrane for the title. And the question is why? Charlie Burley is ranked number five. Homer Williams is ranked number six. Coco Kid is ranked number seven. Now, Jackie Wilson of California is ranked number two. Why did any of those men get a title shot with Freddie Red Cochrane? Ray Robinson would take on Jackie Wilson in 1943. In between two fights with Jake LaMotta. He did it within a three-week span. Freddie Ray Cochrane absolutely avoided. He refused to face Ray Robinson, who was ranked number one for the welterweight championship belt. Now, we'll take a look at the record of Ray Robinson. He began his professional debut in 1940. And you can see the first two fights would be by knockout both in the second round. And as we move up and take a look at Ray Robinson in 1941, well, in 1940, we'll continue with 40. He didn't lose any of his fights. In fact, he only had three knockouts prior to the other portion of his record. 1941, he would have all but four knockouts. I'm sorry, four wins but the rest all knockouts. Some notable names here would be Mike Evans, pretty decent fighter of Philadelphia. Maxie Shapiro, New York, Madison Square Garden, knocked him out in three rounds. Now he would defeat Marty Servo in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, defeated him in 10 rounds. And he would also defeat Fizzy Zivic, New York's Madison Square Garden in 10 rounds. Why is that important? Because Marty Servo would defeat Freddie Ray Cochrane and he would become the welterweight champion of the world. Well, so did Ray Robinson. 
White and Ray Robinson get a title shot? Well, because Ray Robinson didn't fight Freddie Ray Cochrane. Why? Because Freddie Ray Cochrane refused to face Ray Robinson. He defeated Fizzy Zivic, who was a former champion. Fizzy Zivic with defeat. Henry Armstrong, October 4th, 1940. That was Ray Robinson's professional debut. Excuse me for shaking the camera. That's why I always stabilize it. 1942. In fact, let me stabilize this camera. One second. Now, 1942, Ray Robinson takes on Fizzy Zivic, January 16th of that year, knocking him out in 10 rounds. He takes on Maxi Berger, February 20th of 1942. He stops him in two rounds. Norman Rubio, March 20th, 1942. New York's Madison Square Garden. Get rid of him in seven rounds. And he continues. Marty Servo, May 28th, 1942. New York's Madison Square Garden. He defeats him in 10 rounds. So he defeated him in Philadelphia and he defeated him in New York as well. And... Marty Servo in 1946 would refuse to face Ray Robinson. He would wind up vacating his crown after he faced Rocky Graziano. He claimed that he had a broken nose and he wanted to end his career. He wanted to retire. Ray Robinson was knocking on the door. He said, he defeated me twice. I'm not going through this again, so he would retire. He didn't want to face Ray Robinson three times, although he defeated him two times. But he would wind up becoming a welterweight champion because Freddie Ray Cochrane would give him the title shot, but not Ray Robinson, who was ranked number one. Ray Robinson would also defeat Ruben Shank, August 21st, New York's Madison Square Garden, 1942. And he would get rid of him in two rounds. October 2nd, 1942, he would take on Jake LaMotta, New York's Madison Square Garden. He would defeat Jake LaMotta. In 10 rounds. Izzy Genazzo, December 1st. Cleveland, Ohio. Knock him out in 8 rounds. So I just wanted to give you an idea of the activity of Ray Robinson from 1940 to 1942. Up until that point, he had not lost a fight. He was ranked number 1 in 1941. And he did not get a title shot with Freddie Ray Cochrane. Instead, Marty Servo, who... Ray Robinson defeated twice, would get that opportunity with Freddie Red Cock Crane. Now we just go down to 43 for one moment. February 5th, Jake LaMotta, Detroit, Michigan, defeats Ray Robinson in 10 rounds. That's Ray Robinson's first defeat in 40 bouts. February 19th, Jackie Wilson of California, New York's Madison Square Garden. Ray Robinson defeats him in 10 rounds. Three weeks later, Ray Robinson is back in the ring with Jake LaMotta, February 26th of 1943. Defeats him back in Detroit in 10 rounds. Okay. April 30th, he takes on Freddie Carball, Boston, knocking him out in one round. July 1st, Ralph Zanelli of Boston, Massachusetts, defeats him in 10 rounds. And he ends the year off, August 27th, defeating his idol, Henry Armstrong, New York's Madison Square Garden. That's where uh, Henry Armstrong would lose his welterweight championship belt to Fizzy Zivic, and that's where Ray Robinson, who was on the undercard, would begin his professional debut. He defeated Henry Armstrong in 10 rounds. As we take a look at 1942, the ring ranking systems. Middleweight division, Archie Moore is ranked number one. Who's the champion? Tony Zale. Number two is Charlie Burley. Number three is Homan Williams. Number four is Kid Tenoro. Number five is Jose Basora. Number six is Jake Lamato. Number seven is Jack Chase. Number eight is Eddie Booker. Nine is Harry Kid Matthews, who, by the way, would wind up getting... A heavyweight championship title shot with a fighter by the name of Rocky Marciano. Archie Moore, ranked number one. What happened? Why didn't Tony Zale give him a shot? Archie Moore was a middleweight at this point. Why didn't he give Charlie Burley a shot, who was ranked number two? Why didn't he give Homan Williams a shot, who was ranked number three? Or even Kid Tenoro, for that matter, 
Jose Besora, Jacob Lamada. He avoided every last one of those men, Jack Chase and Eddie Booker as well. Welterweight division, 1942. Freddie Raycock claimed to Ray Robinson that he had to take care of Henry Armstrong. So Ray Robinson took care of Henry Armstrong, like I showed you. He fought him in 1943, and he would defeat him. Freddie Raycock claimed never budged. He refused to face Ray Robinson. Number three, you had Jackie Wilson, four Coco Kid, five Earl Turner, all black fighters. And he refused to fight any of them. Just so we see what's going on uh, during those years. Now, I just wanted to go back to 1942 one moment. As I told you, Archie Moore was ranked number one. Charlie Burley was ranked number two. And Holman Williams, who was the colored middleweight champion at that time, was ranked number three. Well, Charlie Burley would take on Holman Williams. He would defeat Holman Williams. And he would now become the colored middleweight champion of the world. Well, Archie Moore was ranked number one. He's trying to find out why Tony Zale won't face him. Tony Zale refuses to uh, face him. He claims now the war is on and his title is frozen. Well, it was not because he would take on two fights during the course of the war. And even if he didn't give Archie Moore a title shot, he disrupted the ranking system. But not facing Archie Moore or Charlie Burley or Holman Williams. 1942. We're at the 1943, excuse me, in the middleweight division. Tony Zale, still the champion. Jake LaMotta is ranked number one. Holman Williams, number two. Jake LaMotta defeated Holman Williams. And what was amazing about this situation here is that Holman Williams was an outstanding fighter and he would wind up defeating Jacob LaMotta. Rank number three is Cody Welch. Number four is Jose Besora. Number five is Steve Belois. Number six is Marcel Sedan. Number seven is Joe Carter. Eight, Ruben Schenk. Nine, Georgie Cochran. Number 10 is Archie Moore. Now, wasn't Archie Moore ranked number one? He was just ranked number one in the middleweight division. He's now number 10. Archie Moore says, the hell with this. I'm moving up to the light heavyweight. I can't take it anymore. And that's what he wound up doing. 1944. So in the welterweight division, Freddie Ray Cochrane was the champion. What happened to Ray Robinson is he was called to war. And they moved him out of the ranking system. Amazing, isn't it? Number one, Tippy Larkin became the number one mandatory for Freddie Ray Cochrane. Number two was Leo Roddick. Number three, Tommy Bell. Number four, Frankie Wills. Five, Ralph Zanelli. Six, Paul Lewis. Outstanding fighter, by the way. Number seven, Cecil Hudson. Eight, Izzy Genazzo. Nine, Al Davis. And number 10 was Freddie Archer. All right, so hopefully I didn't just trying to straighten this out here. All right, so the middleweight division in 1944. Number one, Holman Williams. Number two, Jake LaMotta. Number three, Charlie Burley. Number four, Jose Besora. Number five, Joe Carter. Number six is Vincent Hawkins. Number seven is Coco Kidd. Number eight is Coley Welch. Five is Jack Chase. And ten is Vic Del. Richie, I, I always mispronounce his name, but he's number 10. Okay, so 
what happened with number one, number two? Holman Williams defeats Jake LaMotta. Now he becomes the number one mandatory challenger for Jake, um, I'm sorry, Tony Zales middleweight championship crown. All right, so Ray Robinson reportedly fell down a flight of steps while he was in the war. He wound up in Staten Island Hospital. And he's back in the ranking system. He's now ranked number two. Henry Armstrong is ranked number one. And Freddie Ray Cochrane, Ray, you have to take on Henry Armstrong. He does that. He defeats Henry Armstrong. He's back at number one. What's the problem? Freddie Ray Cochrane is not going to give him any kind of a shot. And Ray Robinson, you know, the war's going on. Freddie Ray Cochrane doesn't have to face him with the title. Sits on his crown. All right, so now we're at 1945. Holman Williams is ranked number one. Tony Zale is the champion. Number two is Charlie Burley. Number three is Jake LaMotta. Number four is Rocky Graziano. Number five is Marcel Sedan. Number six is P is B.B. Washington. Number seven is Aaron Wade. We call him Little Tiger. Eight is Wildcat George Henry. Number nine is Jimmy Edgar. And number 10 is Burt Lytell. Now, let's look at the welterweight for one second. Welterweight champion is Freddie Ray Cochrane. Ray Robinson is ranked number one now because he defeated Henry Armstrong. Number two is Jimmy Doyle. Now, Jimmy Doyle, let's go to number three. Tippy Larkin, number four is Freddie Archer. Number five is Nick Moran. And so Jimmy Doyle would wind up becoming Ray Robinson's First title defense when Ray Robinson would eventually defeat Marty Servo because Fred Cochrane would lose to Marty Servo and Marty Servo would then become the welterweight champion. Once the war is over, Marty Servo would decide to hang up the gloves because he didn't want to face Ray Robinson. He states that his nose broke in a fight with Rocky Graziano, but he didn't want to face Ray Robinson. Everybody knows that. And so Ray Robinson would then become the mandatory challenger. And since Marty Servo would retire, Ray Robinson would now have to take on another fighter for that vacant crown. And since they couldn't get another opponent, they went to rank number seven, who is Tommy Bell. And Tommy Bell would face Ray Robinson December 20th of 1946. New York's Madison Square Garden, Ray Robinson would become the brand new welterweight champion of the world. He had to wait over four years. Now to go back up to the middleweight division, Tony Zale was the champion. Holman Williams was ranked number one, Charlie Burley number two, Jake Lamar number three, and Rocky Graziano four. One year later, Rocky Graziano would get a shot at Tony Zale. Tony Zale leaps frogs over Holman Williams, over Jake Lamar and over Charlie Burley. And that's how he would get that three-fight series with Rocky Graziano. After he would defeat Rocky Graziano in 1948, he would wind up facing Marcel Sedan. Well, what happened with Jake LaMotta, Charlie Burley, and Holman Williams? Now, we're in 1946. Middleweight champion is Tony Zale. Ranked number one now is Jake LaMotta. Rank number two is Charlie Burley. Rank number three is Rocky Graziano. And number four is Marcel Sedan. Let's stop right there. Now, Tony Zale is a champion. Jake LaMotta is ranked number one. Why didn't Tony Zale face Jake LaMotta? Why didn't Tony Zale face Charlie Burley? Jake LaMotta never faced Charlie Burley. So those two were not tied up with one another. Tony Zale leapfrogged over Jake LaMotta. He leapfrogged over Charlie Burley, and he faced Rocky Graziano. Like I said, he would lose to Rocky Graziano in 47 after defeating Graziano in 46. Then he would attempt to get his title back in 48. He would be successful, and he would go straight to Marcel Sedan. He leapfrogged over Charlie Burley, leapfrogged over Jake LaMotta. 1947, we want to look at the light heavyweight division. So Gus Lesnovich is the light heavyweight champion. All right? War's over. Ezra Charles is ranked number one. Archie Moore is ranked number two. Blackjack Billy Fox is ranked number three. Freddie Mills is ranked 
Number four. Number seven is Lloyd Marshall. Number five, I'm sorry, number eight is Bob Foxworth. And we're going to stop there for one moment. What happened to Archie Moore? Why didn't he get a shot with Gus Lesnovich? He's ranked number two. What happened to Ezra Charles? Why didn't he get a shot with Gus Lesnovich? He's ranked number one. Gus Lesnovich told Ezra Charles he had to take on Archie Moore. He didn't want to fight Archie Moore. He didn't want to fight Ezra Charles. That's what the problem was. And this is what happened to black fighters during those years. They would get raw decisions to make sure they don't get the shot at a championship fight. The champion would tell, number one, number two, if they were both black fighters, that they had to face one each other. One would pick one off. And then by the time the fighter who picked off the other fighter would be ready for a title shot, that champion would now move on to another fighter because those two are now occupied. This was the game that was being played. There may be a cut that was suffered. There may be a, a, a fractured hand or something like that. This is what they're banking on. That's how the game was always played. When you look at the middleweight division, Tony Zell lost to Rocky Graziano in 47. He's now number one. Bert Littell was number two. Marcel Sedan was number three. See if we can get. So what happened to Burt Littell? Why didn't he get a shot? Burt Littell was a black murderer's old fighter. And this is what was happening to black murderers, bro. Tony Zale disrupt their chances of getting middleweight championship title fights. All right, so we're in the middleweight division, 1948. Marcel Sedan is now the world champion. He defeated Tony Zale, knocked him out, Jersey City. Number one is Burt Littell. Number two is Steve Belois. Jake LaMotta is number three. Tony Zale is number four. Why didn't Burt Littell get a shot with, Jake, uh, with uh, Marcel Sedan? Instead, Marcel Sedan chose Jake LaMotta. Burt Littell was blackballed. No pun intended. Now, as you can see, Ezra Charles is ranked number two in the heavyweight division. Joe Lewis is the heavyweight champion. And Joseph Joe Walcott is ranked number one. So Joe Lewis fulfills his mandatory request and obligations, and he takes on Jersey Joe Walcott as he Charles is ranked number two. Jersey Joe Walcott loses a very controversial decision with Joe Lewis, and he gets a rematch. This happened in 47, so in 48, he gets a rematch. He stopped in 10 rounds as he Charles would now take on Joe Lewis in 1950. But 1949, Joe Lewis would decide to hang up the gloves, so he would appoint Jersey Joe Walcott, who they felt was railroaded in 1947 against Joe Lewis. And they wanted to make that right by giving him another opportunity at a title shot. Joe Lewis decided to retire in 49, so he would then take on Ezra Charles, who was now ranked number two. Ezra Charles would defeat Jersey Joe Walcott, and he would win the NBA version of the heavyweight championship crown. So I just wanted to go through the ranking system. As you look down the light heavyweight division, Freddie Mills is the light heavyweight champion. Gus Lesnar-Vinch is ranked number one. Leonard Marrow, number two. Archie Moore, number three. Archie Moore would never get a title shot with Freddie Mills. As I can scroll down a little bit, I can show you that Lloyd Marshall was ranked number five. Lloyd Marshall would knock out Freddie Mills. Freddie Mills would get a title shot regardless. And he would lose to Joey Maxim. Joey Maxim would eventually face Archie Moore, but he wanted $100,000 and he would pay Archie Moore $800 for that title shot. In the contract, he requested, regardless, I'm going to fight you three times. If I win, I only fight you once. If I lose, I get two more shots at the light heavyweight championship title. That sounds very familiar of what's happening now. And I just wanted to give you an idea of what was happening to the black fighters during that time. And that's the reason why I do these videos, because I want to make sure that we're clear. When we look at our champions, we have to make sure 
that the champions that we recognize in history and even currently, we know the paper trail because Tony Zale didn't take on all his contemporaries during that time. He didn't. He skipped over a lot of fighters, as I showed you. Gus Lesnar Vince, the same thing. Anton Christopherides, the same thing. And it's unfortunate because now in your record books, black fighters didn't get title shot opportunities, whether they won or lost. And if they won, they didn't get a chance to become a champion. You took that away from him. You took legacy away from him. I don't respect that. That is not the way boxing should be ran. Unfortunately, that's the sport we are involved in. But when I look at your resume and I judge your character, I see that you didn't fulfill your obligations. I cannot consider you as I consider not consider Jack Dempsey a worthy champion for certain fighters in his reign because he avoided some fighters. Let me show you one more thing and I'll end this video. Now, I just wanted to show you 1924 for one moment. Jack Dempsey was the champion. Harry Wills was the challenger. 1924, they signed a agreed contract in 24. Jack Dempsey refused to give Harry Wills his opportunity that they both agreed on. And he tailed Harry Wills around and New York decided to suspend Jack Dempsey's privileges of fighting in New York. Jack Dempsey didn't care. He refused to fight Harry Wills. And that's the situation. So I just wanted to show you how black fighters were conned, how they were manipulated, how they were not promised certain things that they should have been promised, how obligations were not met. And when you look at the champions during that time, you got to look at who they fought, who they avoided. And that was the purpose of looking at the fighting schedule of the third wave of Black Murders Row. So thanks for watching. I'm Scrapbook Boxing Museum of the Forgotten Fistigov series. All great fights, all great fighters were never being forgotten on my channel. I'm tongue tied today. Uh, Jack Dempsey was a hell of a fighter. He was a very, very good fighter. But so was Harry Wills. And we would never know how they would do because Jack Dempsey avoided Harry Wills, as Anton Christopherides and Gus Lesnavich avoided Archie Moore and Ezard Charles, as Tony Zell avoided Homan Williams and Charlie Burley. He avoided Lloyd Marshall, he avoided Archie Moore, he avoided Jack Chase. And so you can't get a true evaluation on how Tony Zale would have done because he was.